Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Matthew Dennison. Hey there, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. So can you tell me about your writing? Yes, I write nonfiction, um, specifically biography, what um, is sometimes called life writing. Um, In every occasion, apart from my new book, which is my ninth book, A Biography of the Queen, I've written about the comfortably dead. So um, my subjects uh, range from ancient Rome um, up to um, English writers who died in the 1960s and and now um, Her Majesty the Queen. I actually want to, I want to talk to you about that because what was it like writing a biography of a person who's still alive and still in a position of power? Um, there was a sort of magnitude to the undertaking. So I, I, I felt, um, I felt a sense of the sheer scale of it, which I'd never had before, even though I dealt with um, epic swathes of Roman history. Something about this immensely long life um, led by by a woman who who can certainly claim to be the best known woman on the planet uh, and a hugely documented life um, felt like an enormous undertaking. Um, I, I was troubled as one always is. I feel as a biographer that you have to feel a sense of responsibility to your subject, however long they have been dead. And of course, that's magnified if they're alive, because whatever one chooses to write is going to be for some readers, the version of that person's life that they take away with them. And and therefore, it's so important that that it's done with integrity and, and that it's done as well as you possibly can. It didn't ever cross my mind that the Queen would sit and read this book in in a state of fury um, because she she isn't a great reader and and she isn't somebody who reads about herself. But given her astonishing record of seven decades of of public service in the United Kingdom and and across the Commonwealth, um, I I did feel a sense that um, this merited an appropriate um, uh, response on the writer's part. Mm, definitely. What interested you in writing about the Queen and transitioning sort of, like you were saying, from writing about people who were dead into writing about her specifically? In some ways, I feel like I've been on a, a collision course, really, to write about the Queen for a long time. So I, I have a very long standing interest in um, monarchy. Um, this biography of the, of the Queen is my fourth royal biographies. So I, I've written biographies of Queen Victoria, um, one of Queen Victoria's children, and um, a Hanoverian queen consort. Um, and I'd written a lot of journalism about the queen. And so when my publishers suggested it, because it came from them rather from than from me in the first instance, obviously my heart did a little skip um, because I thought how wonderful to spend three years of my life in the queen's company. Mm-hmm. Um, it was only afterwards that, that the t- terror k- kicked in. Yeah, I-, I can only imagine. And it's such an expansive history. And I want to talk a little bit more about that with you and like the sort of research, because I can't even imagine the level that you would have had to do for this. Yeah, I, I think, you know, something that is perhaps overlooked is that in, in writing a biography, a, a, a significant decision is what you exclude as much as what you include. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, in order to get to that kind of editing stage, you have to have done um, extraordinary quantities of research to work out what one's going to discard. What I knew when I started this book was that um, I didn't want to say all the things that have been said before. Um, I, I wanted a book where the queen herself remained center stage. And that sounds such an obvious thing to say, but because the queen is a very enigmatic figure and because she doesn't disclose her innermost thoughts and she never has, and she never will, it becomes very easy for books about the queen to be, if you like, a kind of account of what's happened in her 69 years on the throne or a sort of large family saga. And you end up in, in something resembling crown territory mm-hmm. where, where, the, where the queen is always there, but not necessarily the immediate focus. So I knew that I wanted a book in which the queen herself was always um, bang centre stage and the person that we were looking at. Um, I recognized that I had the opportunity in this book that I hadn't had in some of my books to 
to, to, to use primary source material that, that was much more varied than I'd had before, you know, beginning with sort of Pathé news footage in the 1920s, um, children's letters written only five years ago, um, mm -hmm. diary accounts by diplomats' wives, um, uh, receipts from couturiers. Um, you know, there was, there was such a lot of stuff, but what was exciting was how enormously varied the stuff was. And I think um, what is unusual for a biography nowadays of the living figure is because the Queen is um, of, of advanced age and, and, of course, has overlapped with people spanning about 120 years, there was still sort of diary material, which obviously is going to become a problem for biographers in the future as people stop keeping diaries, stop writing letters. Yeah, I yeah, I can't imagine how bi biography writing is going to change. And like, like you were saying about the diaries and everything, because it's like, oh, here's my source. It is a, a Twitter. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tweet that I found from a few years ago that I don't know if it was an edited screenshot or if they posted this, but then it was yeah. deleted. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the changing landscape for that? I think, you know, when you write biography, what you're hoping for is um, something resembling a eureka moment. When you've read and read and read, you tend to have a series of ideas. And um, obviously what one doesn't want to do is wander too far from the hard evidence. And sometimes there will be just some snippets of evidence that, that bring everything together. And so you have that eureka moment of hurrah, you, you know, what was a supposition is borne out by something in reliable source material. That will still be possible for biographers in the future. It's just that what, um, you know, what they will be looking at might be a podcast as opposed to a letter. Um, or, you, you know, it might be, it, it, people still write thank you notes, don't they? Mm. And um, well, let's hope they do. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there will there, there there will still be material. I, I think what is different is that um, the, the landscape of social media always presupposes an audience, and historically, diary writing didn't always presuppose an audience, and letter writing presupposed a known and finite audience. So the way that people present themselves in in their personal written narratives is going to be different because of who they believe they're addressing. And obviously a biographer will have to filter that out or get past that. Yeah, very much so. I, I had never even thought about that. Um, yeah. So what sort of interested you in biography writing and more specifically writing about the royals? Um, I've always read a lot of biography. So um, as a child, I had fairly hands-off parents and um, they... Um, and a house full of books. And so my, my, my reading, like a lot of children, was guided when I was a small child. And then when I got to about 10, um, my parents just sort of left me up to my own devices. And I'm afraid I rather floundered because, um, you know, what do you start reading at 10 when you have read all the children's books your parents think you should read, but you clearly can't quite get to grips with Pride and Prejudice? And so I began by um, reading historical novels, and then I read biographies. So, so I've always read biography. Um, I, I love the idea that, that one can reclothe the skeleton. Um, I, I, I think that's wonderfully interesting. I like the fact that biography steeps one in a period of time. I like the fact that biography, suddenly the way I write biography, it is celebratory. It's, it, it's, a, it's a positive exercise in, in celebrating greatness, greatness of, of, of many different forms. Yeah, well, I love that choice of words. How you just said it's like reclothing a skeleton because that that really what is what it is. And like so many times, at least from what I've found, I've not read that many biographies, um, but through this show, I've actually been reading more. Um, and so many so much of the time it helps shed light on a part of history. And or multiple parts, like with your book, because it really, like you were saying, it it's so expansive um, and it can really help to tell people's stories like that you wouldn't always hear. And I, I love that. Reclothing a skeleton. I'm going to use that in something. <laughs> so 
what do you look for when figuring out if you want to write a biography about someone? Um, You have to feel overwhelmingly excited uh, and there must be a passionate engagement. You know, there's an there's an old idea that um, biographers fall in love with their subjects and this is a bad thing. Well, it seems to me it, it possibly is a bad thing to be in love with your subject, but it's essential that you love your subject. Mm-hmm. If you don't love the person or the people you're writing about, then it seems to me that you won't embrace the whole project with passion and then you won't irradiate those lives in the way that they probably deserve to be. Um, and if they don't deserve that kind of treatment, you shouldn't be writing a book about them anyway. Um, I, if you need, for me, there is never any shortage of subjects. There's always a moment when one's writing a book, when you know one's really struggling and the end doesn't feel close. And at that point, I find that my mind is extremely promiscuous and starts hopping about thinking about other people I'd like to write about. And, and that's a really nice distraction um, during those difficult moments. And then quite often when one reaches the end of the difficult book, Actually, the person one wants to write about next is somebody quite different and and they just land in one's mind. And, um, you know, I have been lucky that in most of my books, I've chosen the subjects myself um, as opposed to having them given to me by a publisher. But, um, you know, my feeling is that I won't run out of subjects. There are so many wonderful lives um, to to explore and celebrate. Yeah. Do you think that you're going to continue to write about people that are alive after having this where you were writing about someone still living? I don't know. I mean, I do a certain amount of writing about living people in the journalism I write. But I think it's very important in writing a biography to be able to stand back and Um, hopefully take a a dispassionate view, even if, as I said, one is passionately engaged. And and that's very difficult if you have um, spent time with a subject or if you've spent time with a subject's family, they've extended hospitality towards you, they've taken that leap of faith and that leap of trust in showing you their papers, their family papers. So I, I... I, I don't know. I don't necessarily anticipate writing, writing um, a, a lot of biographies of the living immediately. And, and, and I can say that because I know that my next two books are of people who are dead. So so, mm. so for the foreseeable future, no, I won't be writing about anybody um, living. Uh, it's also the case that I'm particularly interested. I've always been hugely interested in 19th century. century. I'm particularly interested in the 18th, 19th and early 20th century at the moment. So, so you know, let's face it, these people are going to be dead, aren't they? Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, I really love that you have like sort of a set um, time period as well that you write in because that can make it better for readers, like kind of knowing like you're going to write a lot in this sort of sphere about royals in this time period. Um, I I have hopped about a bit in the books that I've written, but there, there is a sort of connection. So I wrote two ancient Roman books. I, I revisited Suetonius's The Twelve Caesars, and I wrote a biography of the Emperor Augustus's wife, Livia. Um, other than that, um, all of my subjects have been um, post-18th century lives. But, but what all of the subjects have been until I reached the Queen is they've, in a way, all been about how uh, particular subjects find autonomy within their lives, Uh, overcoming struggles that face them in a number of cases because of gender. So I've written about a number of um, forceful women who sought Mm -hmm. empowerment in societies that chose to deny them the empowerment that they, that they wanted. So, so though my time frame has been quite broad, that there is this sort of connective thread in, in the books that I've written. Yes. And I, I I want to talk about that specifically a little bit more because in this book, from what I've been reading, it's like so, so horrifying, but I, I love how the way that you wrote it when they're, when like her whole family is waiting, like, oh, it will, this other brother still has hope. He can have a boy mm-hmm. and it won't have to be her on the throne. Mm-hmm. And everyone is trying to make it so that way. And then they have a second child and it's like, well, it was a girl. Well, we failed. We need to have more. We need to have a boy. And it's like I, it, I loved how you wrote that because it was like 
oh my God, look at how messed up this is. But it still, it really gave a snapshot of that time in history. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I want you to, can you tell me a little bit more about like the work that you have done through your writing, talking about gender and talking about like the, these sort of things that these women had to face? Yeah, I, I for, for a male biographer, I, I have tackled... Um, you know, more female subjects than than is often the case for male biographers. So of my nine books, um, seven have been female subjects. Um, And they have all been of what I think is now referred to as elite background. So they're all people of relatively high social status. But of course, historically, in the case of women, that hasn't meant that they have um, you know, status beyond the kind of status that is inherited through through, through family, mm-hmm. and um, they are women. Vita Sackville West, the, the gardener and writer, or Beatrix Potter, the, the children's writer, for it, it, it strike me very powerfully among the women I've written about. Women who had a very clear idea of how they wanted their lives to be, but goodness, did they face obstacles given their sex? You know, Potter's parents were determined that she would be this spinster daughter who effectively provided kind of free companionship to them in their old age. Um, uh, you know, Sackville West, her, her, her life um, tilted on the fact that she was unable to inherit no the, the house that she grew up in, which she loved passionately. And, and her self-identity was to do with herself as being the inheritor of no, which of course she, as a woman, couldn't be. So, so I, it is so much that we forget, just things that are both large and small, struggles that women have faced historically, that, that once one explores lives, I and mean, you see how much they can distort or shape or colour an existence. Mm. And I really like what you were just saying too, like how a lot of them are elite. And in your book, you address that saying, like she is extremely privileged, but she still has these struggles. Um, mm. And I think that's important because it sheds a light on the struggles that people that may be less privileged also face. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the Queen's life is very different from, from, from most people's lives in mm. because of the particular kind of material privilege that she has enjoyed. Um which no longer really exists, I think, in many places in the world. Um, But it also goes with a degree of deference that attaches to the position of sovereign. And, uh, of course, in a way, though, people would say, well, that's wrong. If, If you have a monarchy, a monarchy has to be something that is respected and looked up to. So the the idea that deference and respect go with the position of monarch is important. Um, And of course, what is remarkable about the Queen is the extent to which she has earned that respect and deference, as well as having it going alongside uh, the position. But mm-hmm. it, it has been a life of challenges because she is fundamentally a modest person and she has an overwhelming sense. And it seems to me that she still has that sense after nearly 70 years on the throne of, of trying to do the best possible job as monarch that she can. And um, that doesn't change because, you know, 2021 is very different from 1952 when she became yeah. queen. The challenges that face her now are profoundly different from the challenges then. And yet she is still expected to be exemplary, to behave in a manner that is above reproach. At key moments like the, the, the recent pandemic, she is still expected to give leadership, reassurance, hope, pats on backs. Um, now, those weren't challenges that faced her in 1952, but they're challenges that are as important now as the challenges of the 50s were in the 50s. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I kind of want to flip over to talk a little bit more of about the research and <clears throat> which of your hardest books was research wise. Um, the ones that stick in my mind are the, the the only one of my books that hasn't been published in the States is a book called The First Iron Lady. And it was about a remarkable German princess called Caroline of Ansbach, who married the man who became the British king, George II. So um, I know that not all um, you know US listeners are familiar with, with, with um, 18th century British monarchs. So George II was the grandfather of George III, who obviously fell out with the American colonies. 
And um, Caroline was this extraordinary force of nature, this, this incredibly ballsy, beautiful, clever minor princess. She was orphaned at quite an early age. She was very poor as a child. She was never taught to read and write. She taught herself to read and write. So her handwriting is nightmarish. But more importantly, she taught herself to spell and she taught herself to spell phonetically. And of course, as a child, she was fluent in French and German. She then made herself fluent in English, but she wrote English as if the sounds were French and German sounds, which she then spelt phonetically. So, so you know, when I read her letters in, in, in the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle, um, that took a little bit of time decoding. Um, oh, wow. It was also the case that, you know, if it's not enough to get past French, German and English source material, I found this fantastic court case where one of her father's mistresses had tried to poison her mother and use witchcraft to kill her mother. And the court records were in Latin. So I had source material in Latin, French, German, English, and then English letters written by Caroline in a mixture of French and German phonetic spelling and the world's worst handwriting. Oh, so <laughs> that was a tricky one. Um, obviously, my <laughs> Roman books, because the source material is all in Latin and Greek, and um, you know my Latin it, it, it is quite good, but my Greek was was rusty. And then a lot of um, significant research done into um, into Roman history is in German. So obviously, I, I slowly read my way through the German research. So so the Roman books and Caroline were difficult because of the um, having to, to, to read in a number of different languages. And then I would say that my other most challenging book was my most recent book, which is a life of Kenneth Graham, the man who wrote The Wind in the Willows. Um, and really, that was challenging because I would say with hindsight that Graham was somebody who didn't want someone to write a biography of him. Um, throughout his life, he was really good at kicking over the traces. And oh. so, you know, he, he was a slightly elusive character. Um, but, but yes, ultimately, I'm pr proud of the book. I'm proud of pinning him down. Um, and it was a rewarding experience. I love that. All of those sound like quite a feat. So what do you do when the source material is in other languages? Do you send it off to translators? What... I'm assuming oh, no, you don't I, just use Google Translate. Um, I don't use Google Translate because it's very dangerous. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, I, I, I do do it myself. Um, when I wrote my very first book 15 years ago, which is called The Last Princess, and in fact, it was reissued, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic last year, and it's a biography of Queen Victoria's youngest daughter, Princess Beatrice, um, a, a lot of correspondence was in German princely archives, and some of the German material was in old-fashioned Gothic um, uh, font, so, so it's essentially a different alphabet. And in that case, I did pay a research student to transcribe those letters and translate them for me, um, because there's always a time you know, there's always a time constraint with writing a book that your publisher is saying, "Where is our manuscript?" And you're saying, "Well, I'm so sorry, I can't understand the letters." So, um, but what I wouldn't do is accept a commission that um, required reading of source material in a language I did I didn't understand. So, for example, I I don't speak Spanish or Portuguese, so. I wouldn't take on, or, or Russian, so I wouldn't take on a Russian, Spanish, Portuguese, Turkish subject because I know I couldn't do it justice. And, you know, you need to feel the stuff yourself. There are, there are nuances in people's choice of words. So it's not simply their meaning, it's those shades of meaning in what people write. And I think you can only tap into the shades of meaning, which of course are so revealing if you have some understanding. Mm -hmm. That th thank you for that. Cause I, I was I was very curious because I mean it's <laughs> it just feels it sounds so daunting writing something like this and going it, through that whole process. It's hugely enjoyable um, as well as being daunting. I, I think writing biography is more difficult now than it was say a hundred years ago because there is an expectation that you will always go back to the raw material and that you will gad about the globe tracking stuff down. I think in the past, English language biographers um, on both sides of the Atlantic were often content to work from secondary sources. And um, obviously, you know, nowadays, um, we expect more than that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was really great My to pleasure. talk to you. Um, everyone, 
go check out all of his books and specifically the new book, The Queen, which is so excellent, really fascinating peek into her life and all of that jazz. All right. Um, I just have one last question, and that is what do you have coming up? I am writing a book about Roald Dahl. Oh, yeah. and he will be my third children's author, and I'm loving it. And hopefully, that will come out next year. That sounds amazing. If if you want to come on the show to talk about that one, please do. Because um, oh in. wow, that sounds that sounds really incredible. I I love Roald Dahl. I've got a box set in here somewhere. <laughs> um, all right. Well, for read between the lines, my name is Molly Southgate. I'm Matthew Dennison. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after. The end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at Read Between the Lines Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.